Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke, the first chapter, verses 39 through 55. You can find that on page 57 of the New Testament in the Pew Bible. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Shh. Lean in. I have uncovered a conspiracy. It's true. I know there's a lot of crazy conspiracy theories out there. I get that. There's the theory that the assassination of John F. Kennedy was a conspiracy by the government led by Lyndon Johnson. I know there's conspiracies around the assassination of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. I know there's the conspiracy theory that says that the government has Bigfoot in a freezer in a laboratory in Georgia. I know. There's the conspiracy that says that the contrails of a jet are really chemicals that the government is spraying upon us to keep us under control. There's the theory, the conspiracy theory, of a secret world order called the Illuminati who are controlling the economy. There's the conspiracy theory that says that Paul is dead and Elvis is alive. I know. Crazy conspiracy theories, but I'm not crazy, and my theory is not a theory. I have uncovered a conspiracy, a subversive plot to take over the entire world. I have found this conspiracy in the pages of Holy Scripture in Luke chapter 1. Would you turn there again with me and let's look at that a little more closely. Luke chapter 1, you'll find it in the New Testament on page 57. And before we dive in, let's pray together. God, as we look at the song of Elizabeth and the song of Mary as we consider these two women in a private meeting on the edges of society. Oh God, give us eyes to see what most people miss. And let what we hear in the next few moments change us. Not only what we do, but who we are. I pray this in Jesus' name, and let all who are brave enough to agree say, Amen. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. 
In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, "'Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Now I want you to think about how subversive this is. What the world sees is two pregnant women. One's a little older, one's a lot younger. One's farther along, the other is just starting to show. Two pregnant women, anybody who happened by would just see two women enjoying each other's company. But little did they know that both of these women were pregnant because of miracles. One of them had been old and barren. The other was a virgin who had never been with a man. And little would people know that one of these women was about to give birth to God's greatest prophet, John the Baptist. And inside the other one, the younger one, God Himself was taking on human flesh and preparing to enter the world disguised as one of His own creatures. Little do they know, people passing by, what God is doing right under their noses. But Mary knew. Look at verse 46. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked with favor on the lowliness of His servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. Are you getting this? Mary is talking about social revolution. She is talking about a plot to undermine the existing world order. If Mary had been alive in America in the 1950s, there's a good chance somebody would have dragged her before Congress and asked her, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm not advocating communism, far from it. I'm not calling Mary a communist, far from it. I am calling Mary a revolutionary who plotted to overthrow the existing world government. She says, God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Now just in case you didn't get it. Mary's prophesying the end of the world as we know it, predicting that her child is going to launch a revolution. You know, we always think of Mary as gentle and sweet and meek and mild. You know, round John Virgin, mother and child, so meek in her blue dress. But this is tough talk. This, this is revolutionary stuff. This song by Mary is called the Magnificat because it starts out with, my soul magnifies the Lord. Magnificat in Latin, magnifies, magnificat. That's what this song is referred to. E. Stanley Jones, the famous Methodist missionary, called the Magnificat the most revolutionary document in the world. Martin Luther said that the Magnificat comforts the lowly and terrifies the rich. William Barclay, famous New Testament commentator, called it a bombshell filled with revolutionary terror that turns the world's standards upside down. In the Magnificat, Mary lets us know that Christmas is the subversive story of an upside-down kingdom. Christmas 
is a conspiracy to change the world as we know it. And it all started with two women, two ordinary pregnant women, one older, one younger, one pretty far along, the other just starting to show. Anybody who happened by would just see two women enjoying each other's company, but little did they know what God was up to right under their noses. Which raises the question, What other things is God doing right now, right under our noses, that we don't even know about? If you've watched the news this week, you know about the presidential debates, and you know that Congress passed a budget deal, and you know about Obama's press conference on Friday, but you probably didn't know that in Africa, 32,000 people will give their lives to Jesus Christ today. You probably didn't know that this week around the world, 3,500 new churches will open. Now, if you've kept up with the news this year, you've probably heard about the research study that was released in May by the Pew Research Center. It was all over the news. The Pew Research Center did a major study, a major survey, and found that Christianity in America is declining. Church attendance is down. The percentage of people who say they are Christian is down. But what you may not know is that according to the same study, the number of committed Christ followers is actually going up. Probably didn't hear much about that. It wasn't talked about as much. Yes, the study found there are fewer cultural Christians. There are fewer people who go to church just because it's the thing to do. But there are actually more committed Christians who take their faith seriously. And if you're up on economic news, you probably know that China owns most of our foreign debt. What you probably don't know is that every single day 10,000 Chinese people give their lives to Jesus Christ. You probably didn't know that there are more evangelical Christians in China than in the United States. This despite 66 years of repression by an atheistic communist government. It seems the church grows best under persecution. Maybe we wouldn't com- shouldn't complain about being persecuted. Maybe we should welcome it. God is at work right under our noses, quietly working to undermine the current world order and overthrow the existing establishment in every place where they've tried to stamp out the gospel. It just grows. But just like 2,000 years ago, when Mary and Elizabeth got together, just like then, so it is now, most people really don't know what's going on. And it's certainly that way with Christmas. People look at the baby in the manger, and he's so cute. He's so sweet. What they don't really realize is that this child is actually God sneaking behind enemy lines and recruiting subversives. C.S. Lewis said, Enemy-occupied territory, that's what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. Christmas is a conspiracy. It is the subversive story of an upside-down kingdom. Make no mistake and don't be fooled. The ultimate goal of Christmas is to overthrow the current establishment. Baby Jesus is really King Jesus. And one day, He will return, not as a babe in a manger, but as one who is triumphant in victory. One day He will return to set up His kingdom and run things His way. But until that day, He's recruiting subversives. People who say, my allegiance is not to the current establishment. People who go ahead and start living by the values of the upside-down kingdom while the rest of the world goes after money and power and prestige and pleasure. These subversives 
go about quietly seeking the kingdom of God and recruiting other subversives to join them. Be careful. They might come after you. Here's the thing. These subversives, these revolutionaries, the perpetrators of this conspiracy, these people could be anywhere. They could be anywhere. Oh yes, you will find many of them here in this room worshiping on Sunday, but during the week, they're out there, they're out there. They could be anywhere, beyond the walls, following Jesus in mission to the world. During the week, you might find them serving meals at Bethany Cafe or feeding the homeless at New Story Church. You might find them visiting the sick or caring for the lonely. You might find them ministering in prisons and serving the poor. You might find them sharing Christ through word and deed. You might find them recruiting other subversives. You might find them recruiting you to join the conspiracy. This group of conspirators, these subversive revolutionaries, they are called church. They don't go to church. They are the church. They don't go to church. They are the church. Seven days a week, the body of Christ, secret agents on a mission to overthrow the current establishment. And here's the question. Here's the question. Do you want to join the conspiracy? Let's bow our heads. I invite you in this time to reflect on where you stand in regards to the coming King. Have you become one of His subversives? Have you pledged allegiance to the kingdom that is coming to overthrow the current establishment? Have you made a conscious decision to accept the gift Jesus gave you when He died for you and commit your life to follow Him as Lord? I invite you to think about that now. And if you'd like to join the conspiracy, I'm going to give you a moment just to pray your own prayer of commitment. To say something like, Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I believe you died to pay for my sin. I believe you died to give me new life. And I know that you're coming back to establish yourself as king. From this point forward, I want to follow you. I invite you to pray something like that in silence, in your own words. Oh God, count us among the conspirators. Count us among those who pledge allegiance to the kingdom that is coming. Use us to recruit more subversives to change this world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And let those who are brave enough to agree say, Amen. Amen.